when the kids start coming, the first group, they were just like running all together, the 50 kids. And you could see the dust coming up and the kids running and then throwing their shoes somewhere. And we were just like, what do we do now? Hello amateurs, welcome to episode 57 of the Amateur Rugby Podcast, here to help soothe your Christmas hangover with some astonishing rugby chat about the grassroots of the game. I'm your host Tim and today I'm in Dorset, England, and it's cold and it's just a bit damp like it is in England this time of year. It's a far cry from the heat of Morocco when I'm from where I spoke to you last. And getting back was a bit of a faff in the current conditions, but I made it back and I'm really looking forward to a family Christmas this year. Anyway, my guest today is Sophia Domingos. Sophia and I met whilst on a rugby coaching expedition in Africa. This interview was recorded in October of 2020 when Sophia welcomed me to Braga in Portugal. We chatted about our incredible time together in Africa, coaching rugby to countless children. We talked about how Sophia got into rugby, which is a female in rural Portugal, is almost a minor miracle. And finally, we dug into a time in Ireland playing for Old Belvedere Rugby Club. It is a quite remarkable story. So please welcome Sophia Domingos. Sophia Domingos. Yes. Welcome to the Amateur Rugby Podcast. Thank you very much. And people may recognise a slight accent there. And <laughs> why don't you tell everybody where we are and a little bit about the town. So we're in Braga in Por- Portugal. Yeah, so I'm Portuguese, that's why there is uh, an accent. And we've had like a nice whirlwind trip of Braga for the last 24 hours or so. Enjoyed the historic centre and all of that kind of stuff. There was a lot of churches. And it was good for me because I don't really know the city that well. So it was good to have someone to explore the historical part of the city. And we even had the, the chance to go to Guimarães and check the castle there. So that was fun as well. Yeah, what's special about that castle? It's in the first city in the country. It's the crib of Portugal, we call it. So the first king was, was there, and but it was basically one of the first cities as well. It was called Bracara at the time. But we met back in 2017. In Africa, we were teammates as part of the Bubesi Pride. So I'd love to hear, just tell the people a little bit about the Bubesi Pride, what they do and, and what our roles were at that time. So Bubesi Pride Foundation is uh, a foundation who brings rugby to children in Africa. So our job was to go to schools, coach some rugby, and then organise a tournament at the end of a week where we gather all the kids from all the schools we were coaching. And it was loads of fun. I think we organized the first tournament together in yes. Nairobi, wasn't it? Yes, we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that was a kind of a, a new thing for me. There was, I think, 500 children, something around that. So many. <laughs> <laughs> so many. And, yeah, I got this life memory of something that happened in that tournament where I forgot to name the trophies. And Pierce, who was, you interviewed before, and he was our project manager at the time, and he called me aside and said, Sophia, did you give the names to the trophies? And I said, oh, no, I forgot. I have to do it now. And he said something like, you know, poor preparation, something about <laughs> Poor piss preparation gives to something bad. I can't remember. It was a five piece. And every time I do something, I, I'm not prepared for something, which it doesn't happen very often because I always remember the, the five P's. There was the five P's Piers told me that time. And I remember he said that, but he was very calm telling me something I was doing very wrong. And I look at him and I was like, puh, puh, puh. oh, okay. But I got the message at the time. So it was, it was a funny, it was a funny moment. And for me, 
that I was in Africa as a coach for five months. And that happened in my second week. So the first week of coaching. So it had a big impact in my my journey. Yeah. <laughs> Funnily enough, Piers mentioned that in when in his interview as well. Mm-hmm. He mentioned that moment. It was clearly quite a pivotal one for for everybody involved. But you mentioned the number of kids there. That was a big factor in everything we did. So can you just sort of like expand on that and talk about how many kids we were coaching on any individual day and how many people we had to organize for this tournament and how many of us there were to do it? I think we were 13 coaches from all over. So there was me from Portugal, for example. There was a few from England, Ireland, Australia, two guys from Germany and a Kiwi. Uh, And uh, we had Jacques Berger as well in the group. So that was kind of fun as well. I was was very excited to have him in the group. So we were split in smaller groups and we were going to these schools in the slums of Nairobi. And we were coaching around 150 kids per afternoon. Three groups of 50, if I recall. And yeah, that was a full week going coaching all afternoon in Nairobi. And then at the end of the week, oh, talking about all the values, the pride values, we had professionalism, respect, integrity, discipline, and enjoyment. Yes. Nice. Well done, Sophia. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, at the end of the week, we had to organize this tournament. And I didn't really, uh, well, I've organized some tournaments here in Portugal before. I, I was a coach before uh, here in Portugal. I was a player. I worked as a development officer. So... I kind of knew how to work around that, organizing the games. and But there were so many kids and everything was organized, but at the same time a bit chaotic. And it was the full experience. Everything was new. The place, the, the people there, they always want to help. But it's it, everything is different. I remember I was very tired at the end. but. The feeling of achievement, it was really good and everything went well. Yeah, it did. And I also was completely exhausted by the end. Mm -hmm. And the things you mentioned there about it being so many people and so many kids and wanting it to be perfectly organized. And you just have to accept that it it never is and it's never going to go as smoothly as you want, which I found quite difficult because I like to plan (laughs) things out. Like I'd coached for three years previously and I really quite strongly planned everything that I did. So to go into that environment and have a situation like on the coaching days where you're just herding cats, you're just (laughs) trying to keep kids involved. And if you can get any kind of rugby into them whatsoever, it's kind of a bonus really. So I like, I really struggled with that mentally to sort of process that you're just doing the best you can and something good will come out of it. I I was uh, that first week I was coaching at a school called, Tika Road, and I was coaching with Ian, our uh, Irish lad, and uh, I remember he was very young, he was like 18 years old at the time, he looked like a child, he had the face of a child, <laughs> and when they said, oh, you're staying with Ian, I was like, okay, this will be interesting, and we were excited, he was so excited about coaching and being there, and then when the kids start coming, the first group, they were just like running all together, the 50 kids. And you could see the dust coming up and the kids running and then throwing their shoes somewhere. And we were just like, well, what do we do now? <laughs> that was like just a moment. Then we were like, okay, we need to organize the kids, start the coaching. Then we also had Joseph helping out. Uh, Joseph was a, a Kenyan coach. He helped us out that year, but in 2019, he became a, a Pride member. He was a volunteer as well. So that was that was really good also to see him first there in 2017 and then coaching with us. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a, a very good experience that first week. Yeah, and you learn some lessons quite quickly, don't you? Like you don't give the balls out too soon because they, <laughs> they've just gone, kicked all yeah. corners of the ground, and then... 
The other challenge as well, which we haven't mentioned yet, was language. So some of the kids did speak and, and understand some language, but most didn't. So we had to learn like basic the basics of each language in whichever country we went to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I found Swahili one of the easiest ones. Right. Yeah, we were talking t early today about the uh, the Spanish or a language that is easier for us to to understand. And I found Swahili so easy to to learn. For example, Chichewa. I spent so much time with one of our drivers, Simeon. And I still can't say a word of Chichewa. Yeah. And he was kind of sad about that. But uh, he, was, uh, he said to me once, yeah, you, you kind of know how to speak Swahili, but you can't speak my language. Yeah, I felt ashamed. <laughs> uh, it was a bit embarrassing. And it, it's true, but the Swahili, it, was, it became very easy for me to catch and to, to start speaking it. So. Yeah, it's a good one about language. I still remember because... Just in the rules of the game, the touch game that we played, we all the players at uh, tackle had to get back five, yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. the one bit I can remember. <laughs> Tano Numa, Tano Numa, because I refereed yeah. so many games, and you're just saying it over and over and over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's the the one bit of language that I genuinely True. have never forgotten from that trip. Yeah, I, I uh, in the the next two years there was some uh, volunteers who actually could coach like that in every country. And hats off. I was so happy to see that happening. And I said, I, I can't really, really do that. Maybe because English is not even my first language. So that uh, was a barrier. I remember even the training week, there was a case like that. When we were at the Olola Lodge. And we were like a, a role play coaching. And Ollie said, are you... You need to say some words in their language. You need to... And I was so into the coaching, trying to speak proper English. Mm. And he was telling me, yeah, you know, you need to try the language. It's not just English, okay? You can try some Swahili. And me and the German guys were like, hey, we're already <laughs> speaking a different language full time, okay? It's difficult to put another language, extra language. So, that, yeah, that was... Um, funny part like from the start <laughs> yeah super tough but in terms of the coaching like challenge that it, it brought then it just meant that you had to be really good at demonstrating what you wanted yeah. and because you're never going to have all the words that you need to describe the things that you want to do so you had to True. demonstrate in the skills or the game or whatever what became super important yeah or getting the teachers to to help you there was this story in Tanzania in Dar es Salaam where I got by myself at a school and Pierce told me yeah you can do this if you you'll stay by on your own in this school and I was like piece of cake I've done this in uh, Nairobi in Jinja Uganda Arusha Moshi Tanzania so I thought well this is easy I can do this on my own so I was wondering where is the teacher who can speak English and help me out translating. And the teachers didn't know how to speak any English. So they said, well, you need to speak Swahili. So I asked Mary, which was the Kenyan volunteer at the time, and she translated all the pride values and what they mean in Swahili. And I went to school and I said to the teacher, Look, can you can you read this to the kids? And she said, Oh, this is a primary school, Sophia. We are all here learning, so you read this to the kids. <laughs> of course it was not this straightforward because she couldn't speak any English. She just pushed me in okay. front of the kids. <laughs> yeah. And I had to read it. And the kids understood, so it was fun. And then I tried to find some words that they could understand to uh, change things a little bit. So if they were all gathered in one point, in Portuguese we say it's like chicken with corn. When you oh, throw yeah. the corn and all chicken go. And I, I told them, this is like the corn and you're the chicken all around and chicken is cuckoo. <laughs> so every time I said cuckoo, cuckoo, they understood they were all around the ball and they had to spread. <laughs> so I was just 
like shouting chicken, chicken, and they just spread out and pass the ball backwards. So, yeah, that was uh, another one. That's brilliant. But, <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. So, you were there for five months, which was the whole trip. Yeah. Like, I, I only yeah. did three, which mm-hmm. felt like a lifetime, to be honest, because it was, it was thoroughly exhausting, the whole thing. I'm just wondering which. Which countries or were there certain teams or people that you really sort of felt an affinity towards and you really enjoyed? And I think every year was a bit different. So, yeah, the first year in 17, I was there for five months. Oh, this is a good point, by the way. You, so you were a volunteer along with me in 2017, but then you went yeah. on to project manage yeah. the following two years. Yeah, true. And mm. instead of staying five months, I was seven months and a half. So, yeah, there was a different years, different connections. I really enjoyed Mozambique because of the language connection. I think that's a bit obvious. Well, not to everybody. So they speak Portuguese in Mozambique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody knows that, yeah. And Alex, uh, he's uh, the coach and he was kind of working in the development of rugby in in Mozambique, like Maputo on that, that time. And uh, yeah, I think it was really good the way he was trying to make all his coaches part of what we were doing. We coached in Mozambique, the coaches, in the morning, and then in the afternoon we were going to the schools. So we spent so much time. I remember in Mozambique, I never felt as tired as that. Like after that, I can't remember any moment I was as tired as, <laughs> as I was at that time because I was the only one in the group speaking Portuguese. So I was translating everything at all time. And then we were coaching the coaches in the morning. We were coaching at the schools in the afternoon. And at night, we were still going sometimes to coach the, the team, mm. the senior team. So. It was very, very tiring, physically and mentally. I, I, there was moments I didn't know if I was speaking Portuguese or English. <laughs> you, <laughs> Did you, you remember that? You basically, <laughs> you talked for the entire week. Every moment you were awake, you were translating something for somebody. Yeah. I, I remember, I don't know if it was with you or probably it was with Joe <laughs> because we were sharing the same room and we had more relaxing times where I just spoke to her in Portuguese and he would just keep looking at me but she wouldn't say anything she would just say okay but she would say i don't understand what you're saying you're speaking the wrong language uh, that happened a few times so we started in kenya then we go to uganda then tanzania where we we were going to three different places then we were going to mozambique from mozambique malawi Zambia, Botswana, Namibia, and South Africa. Yeah, yeah. incredible trip. Yeah, um, in a van. Yeah, in a in a little van that you couldn't really see out of the windows, and the seats were tiny. It was not a particularly comfortable existence on the days worth of driving that we had to go through. Yeah, especially for you. And yeah, and one or two others who were <laughs> on the larger side. Harry, when he turned up, was. Much longer than I am, that's for sure. So he had his knees by his chin for a lot of the time. But there was one other thing that happened in Africa as well, and that was we had a proper full-on game with, was it against one of the local club sides? Yeah, 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 yeah. And you played? I I played. I played that game. That was one of the nicest rugby pitches I've ever seen. The the end of the day there, the the sunset was amazing. And we spent there a few days playing touch and we decided, okay, we'll come back tomorrow and play contact. And there was just boys playing, or men. (laughs) There was more men than boys, actually. And I think it was a a bit from everywhere, actually. And you have, I would risk to say, all races there mixed up and just playing on playing the game we love and just tackling each other. I was the only girl on my side of the team and there was just one girl on the other side. I remember there was this uh, good tackle that I was, I almost tapped my own back. And <laughs> that was, technically, that was a good, a good 
a good tackle. Because the girl on the other team was an international. Right? Yeah, so. but I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> Piers only said that at the end of the game, so I didn't really know who she was yeah. when we were playing. So, but that, yeah, that made it even better. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, how did you feel about playing in a full contact game with a load of blokes and boys? I, it's amazing. I, I kind of, I get a little bit upset when they don't tackle because oh she's a girl I don't want to hurt her and I just take advantage of it I'm like oh you're the one missing you <laughs> you missed this and they're like oh but she was a girl I didn't want to no no it's your mistake if I'm here you need to tackle me like anyone else so that was a really fun game to play for us as team bonding I think it was great we always managed to have a pint a safari after and it, yeah, and it's it's always good to get to know the locals. And Arusha had a big amount of um, people living there. Some of them, they lived there all their lives. Some, they moved a few years ago. So it's, a, it's always good to have that part of uh, non-touristy side of the, the local, the locations we, we go. Yeah. Yeah, so I refereed that game. Mm -hmm. So I was right in the mix of of everything. And yeah, it's fair to say you didn't take a a backward step or shirk a single thing. (laughs) So I I've just like I find it really interesting that you just dived into that because I'm not I don't know. Obviously you've played a lot of women's rugby. Would you say that a lot of your teammates would have done the same? I don't know. I don't really know. Some of them would jump heads first. Maybe others would say, I think It just depends on... And I guess you kind of knew all of our guys already. Yeah. So you kind of knew that, you know, you could hang with them, basically. (laughs) (laughs) It depends. I avoided some of them. (laughs) I remember Harry played 10 really well. He had a great kick. And his sidestep was quite good as well. So I made sure I was in his team. So I didn't have to deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> deal with any of that. Yeah, when they were splitting the teams, I was trying to just, okay, I'm just going this side and try to stay with Harry. I didn't want to run when he was kicking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, cool. So when you go on a trip like that, you end up making some quite close bonds and becoming good friends. So I'm interested in the story that ended up with you going to Murrayfield in Edinburgh. <laughs> How did, how did that come about? That started in Namibia that, that year, in, in 2017. So we were coaching in uh, Walvis Bay. Uh, we were watching the draw, and he said, Lancer is playing Glasgow in early November. And I said, ah, it would be great if we could watch it together, because at the time I was living in Dublin, so it was just a half an hour flight. And he said... Okay, let's do that. And so. Oh, wait, so it was Lewis, right? It was, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. So Lewis Lewis is from Oban in in Scotland. And we made a pact that I would go and watch that game, Lancer Glasgow, in in Glasgow. So not Murrayfield, but we'll get there. Oh, okay, sorry, yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, that was in Glasgow. So after that, we came back home and then I applied to for the position of a project manager and I got the position so when they asked me so when does it suit you to come to England or Scotland to have your training and I said well I'm planning to go (laughs) on the 4th of November because I'm going to watch this game with with Lewis and they said okay great so you'll do the training in Scotland with Rory, which was our operations lead at the time. And I I was very happy because I've been in Edinburgh once, so I decided to stay for a full week. So I arrived in Glasgow, we went to Edinburgh and had the training at Murrayfield. That was the first time I saw a pitch with lights on. Wow. Yeah, (laughs) we don't have that in Portugal. We don't need that in Portugal. So I had the training for two, three days at Murrayfield at one of the, the boxes on, on top. 
that was a special, it was very special for me. There were some jerseys on the walls. All those small things that can be nothing for someone who goes to those stadiums, big stadiums, all the time. But for me, and as a Portuguese person who doesn't have that, we don't have that in Portugal. Mm. Uh, football is big. Everyone knows about football. Even if you don't want to know about football, you will know because it's everywhere. But rugby is not that big. So I was very, very happy to be there. And I took pictures of every corner of that place. And when we finished, I was supposed to meet Louis in, back in Glasgow again, but only the day after. So Rory asked me if I wanted to spend the night in Troon and he could show me around. So I went to Troon as well, which I never, that was not ever in my plans to go. <laughs> but it was, it was nice. And I liked this experience of traveling and getting to know the people from those places because they always show you something extra, something special than tourists don't see that often. You probably feel that way too when you go to places where you... Yeah, for sure. There's yeah. the tourist experience and then there's the, the locals' experience yeah. and you get a much nicer feel for a place, I think, and you understand more when you're there with somebody who's mm -hmm. either lived there all their life or a lot of time. So I went to Troon, I came back from Troon, I met Louis and Ali. He had been our uh, media producer uh, in 17. We watched the game. I can't remember the score. <laughs> you guys won though, right? Leinster won, I'm sure. Uh, Or did they not? They didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I was so confident before that match. And it was just, a, it was a, a very good game. Like, actually, in the beginning, there was like uh, one try for each team every two minutes. Mm. So we were all pumped to, with the game. But then Glasgow started going strong. So, I yeah, but I don't really remember how no. it ended. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I just love the story. I love the story of a promise made at a random moment in right in the bottom of Africa, and, yeah. which is fulfilled in, in Scotland, in, Scotland. On, in a wet, windy day yeah, in Scotland. Yeah, yeah. And then I got the opportunity to go to Auburn as well. I asked him, so are we staying here in Glasgow these next three days? And he said... No, no, we're going to Auburn, you're meeting my family, my friends. And Louis has this, he doesn't get very excited. He gets excited, he just doesn't show it that much. <laughs> so he was talking about Auburn, like, this is Auburn. There is not much happening here. You come here and there'll be a bonfire. There will be a bit of music. Yeah, mom and dad are around. and. It, it look, everything looked, it sounded like a bit almost boring. Mm. But I said, that's great, you know, it's something different. I don't care. When in Portugal, we don't really care about the 5th of November. Uh -huh. So I had no idea about any of that. And when we arrived there, we were at his place and they don't lock the doors. So his friends started coming in. They open the door, they come in. And they sit around, and they're all chatty. Then we were drinking hot whiskey, which I loved mm -hmm. as well. <laughs> <laughs> and then they say, okay, it's time, let's go. But I had no idea what was happening. I was just following Lewis. And then we go outside, we walk for five minutes, and I start listening to a band with a, how do you call it? Oh, bagpipes. Yes. Yeah. They're playing the pipes, and but a, it was like a, a band of I don't know, 10, 15 people. It was it was loud, and it was almost midnight. And then this fire starts, and it's huge. And I, I was just wondering and comparing it to Portugal. I was like, is this allowed? <laughs> Are you going to burn the full forest around? And he was like, oh, no, of course not. That doesn't happen here. Uh, so it was a It became this amazing experience that I've, I would never live if I didn't have a friend from uh, a small town in, in Scotland. Uh, yeah, and we met, in, we met in Africa. So that was, it was very special. I remember I came back 
And I have no words to describe how wonderful those three days in Oven were. Yeah. Yeah. It was very special. Yeah, I love those rugby <laughs> friendships that, that span the globe. And, you know, Portugal to Scotland's not that far, but it's a world away in terms of experience and, and yeah, culture for sure. Yeah, yeah. I also had Joe coming to Portugal in September and I made sure I drove her. I was driving her around the country yeah. as much as I so could. So Joe's Australian. Right? Joe's Australian, so yeah. I promised her I'd go to Australia, but not yet. <laughs> <laughs> maybe soon, maybe soon. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's rewind right back to the beginning. How did Sophia get into rugby to begin with in Portugal? How did that happen? Well, I, I'm from a small town in a region called Alentejo, where uh, there is a little rugby there and in my hometown there was no rugby at all and some of my friends they came back from uni they finished uni they started playing in uni and when they came back to Portugal, they decided they wanted to oh let's make our own club so I was kind of watching that happening but I had no idea mm. about rugby the rules nothing and when they start playing my Dad's company was a sponsor with gas and transport. And we were a big family, so we had a van with nine seats. And my dad said, I paid the gas, I pay, you can take the car, but I don't want anyone else to drive the car unless it's you. So I said, well, that's fine, I don't mind. So I was driving the players to their games. Wow. Uh, how, old you, how old were you at this point? I was 19, 20 at the time. So I was driving them to the, the other towns where they were going to play. And then I would sit in the, on the, the seats at the, on the pitches and take pictures. So they started asking me, oh, just stay here on the bench with us and you can take pictures with the official camera. So I was just there on the sideline taking pictures. That's how it started. <laughs> And then a few months later, they asked me if I wanted to, to play. And I said, no, I don't want to play. I, you know, I, you don't have any girls yet. And no, no, we have some girls to play. And I, I kind of postponed it for a few months. But then I kept going to all these games with them. And yeah, I, I finally decided, yeah, I'm, I'm training with you guys. So for a, a year or so, I was just training with the boys. Right. So with the senior team, because that was the only team at the rugby club. So what was, that, what was that first experience like of playing rugby for the first time against or with uh, adult men? It, it gave me... I could take pain very well, <laughs> <laughs> let's say, because I, I didn't want to be... The girl who's crying because I hurt myself with a tackle. So I just didn't complain. I would just keep going. And sometimes I was in my head, I was, oh my God, that hurts so bad. But at the same time, I didn't want to give them that. I want, I really wanted to play with them mm. or I wanted to play. And that was my only chance. So I didn't want to make them feel bad about it. And so, of course, I just uh, took it and uh, swallowed some tears. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was it. Yeah, then some girls join in. And we managed to have our first game in 2008. A uh, uh, girls game. Yeah, game. yeah, yeah, yeah. A girls game against another team who just started as well. It was the city day. So it was in May. And... It was raining for five days, so the pitch was all muddy. We were not kicking to the post because we didn't know how to. Right. Uh, and because of the two, it was the first game for both teams. So the rules were adapted to us. But so I remember the, the, the feeling. I scored the, the only try, I, my team scored. And I remember the feeling was just amazing. <laughs> And I remember I was so pumped for that game and everything looked so fast and happening so many things at the same time. And there was no space anywhere and I just kept going and hitting and hitting and hitting. Uh, and we recorded that game. <laughs> <laughs> and then I watched the game and I was like, oh, 
that's sad. <laughs> it looked like we were just hitting a wall that was just there, but not two meters to each side. So, but we just didn't look up. We were just going to the wall. Just commit, committed to just going <laughs> yeah. forward, trying to go forward. Yeah. So that was one of the things I always try to. I like I like to play, and I I really enjoy women's game rugby, but men's rugby at the time was in such a level that I didn't have a female team to compare anything. Mm. Um, so you were still training with the guys at this point as well? At this time it was 50-50. Okay. I was training with the boys because I enjoyed it and I felt that was positive for me, but I was training with the girls as well. Women in Portugal were only playing sevens when they were able to even have seven players. I remember sometimes we were going to tournaments with five players and we just had to borrow or play with five. So then I decided I want to play the highest level I can uh, in rugby and I decided to move to, to Ireland. Yeah, how did that come about? Well, at the time I was in Caldas, in Caldas de Reina, here in Portugal, working as a, a rugby development officer. And we were doing a good job. We were a team of four. We were coaching, we were playing, everything. And I decided, okay, this is the moment for me to get out of here. I'm 27. I got a knee injury that year. So I had surgery. I couldn't play the full season. And that gave me a lot of time to think, okay, I'm 27. What do I want to do with that injury? I lost the the opportunity to play international in Portugal. So I decided if I can't do that in Portugal, I'll just play the highest level I can. So I just started looking around and I found this uh, lady who was trying to connect girls from other countries. She's Brazilian and she lives in Dublin. She was trying to bring girls from other countries to play. Okay, how did you find her? Something on Facebook. I don't really know. <laughs> the modern, the modern way. Yeah, and, uh, I remember it was one month since the day I decided to go to Ireland and the day I arrived to to Dublin. So wow, it fast. was fast. Yeah. And had um, you? Had, how much travelling had you done before that? Had you been out of Portugal? Or had you been to other places around the world? Or uh, yeah, yes, yeah. I've been a few times in Spain. Some countries in, in Europe, I went to Canada and the States, I okay. went to New York. So travel, travel wasn't completely Yeah, yeah travel was, was okay. I didn't have a problem with traveling. And I didn't have a problem of adapting to new things, being out of my comfort zone. But I remember going in on that flight and thinking everything was white. I, didn't, I had no idea what was going to happen. Is this real? Like, is the lady there to pick me up at the airport? Uh, is she a good person? Like, we spoke a few times online, but I, I, everything could go wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I was there with my two, my life in two big bags, and that was it. And then when I arrived, she was there. Uh, Sophia, Sophia, I'm here. I'm the one taking care of you. I'm Claudia, and that that was it. I lived with Claudia in the same house. She was renting her one of the rooms in her place. Almost the, the four years I was in, in Ireland, I arrived. I started playing in Old Belvedere in Dublin. What was the first session like? Did they know there was a girl coming from Portugal to join the club? Was it like prearranged? Yeah. Were they expecting you? Or did you just kind of turn up and start playing? They knew I was arriving, but they had several like me. Okay. So at one point I thought, yeah, this is so good for them. Like they have someone from the outside. And when they were like, they were like, oh, you're one of the new girls. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Yeah, there was a, a Spanish international. She played in uh, Girona in professional for some time. She played the national team for a few years. She couldn't speak any English. I could speak Spanish, I could speak English, so I was in between. Yeah. We became really good friends, Marta. And then there was Camilla from the Czech Republic, who was an international. She became the, the captain. 
the right. team captain of the Czech Republic uh, national team. So there were big names, and then they were like, so, Sofia, how many times have you played for Portugal? <laughs> uh, none. <laughs> I've got a leg injury. Yeah. <laughs> and then they asked me, so what position do you play? And I started thinking. I was like, well, I only played seven. So in that, like between Camilla and Marta, I, I was just the bottom of everything. It was a struggle in the beginning, but... I was very happy I made it to the first team. There were two teams there, a lot of girls playing. and But that was a very good experience, yeah. And just thinking about the difference in playing surface from Portugal to then go, go and play in Ireland, what were the pitches like and how did you find it? And the weather in the depth of winter? The pitches were greener, for sure. <laughs> I, yeah, I didn't have much, I didn't really know much about Ireland's, Ireland's weather and how everything goes around that. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they love to talk about the weather. And I noticed that once I arrived, they're always talking about the rain and how it's going to rain and the sunlight and how it snowed four years ago. And yeah, and, uh, all these funny stories. And I was like, your pitches, what do you do to make them green? So green and so full. And they're like, nothing. <laughs> Actually, we do nothing. And I was thinking, in Portugal, we have this um, G4, G3, what you call them? Yeah, 3G, 3 yeah. or 4G, yeah. Yeah, the synthetic ones. Mm. And yeah, we thought in Portugal, because it's so hot during summertime, that that would be... A, a good option but it, I don't think that's the option because it's so hot that it burns mm. when when we play so the pitches here in Portugal they have names like the hell <laughs> or the the pan the frying pan they all have these the pots <laughs> so they they all have these names related to something very very it's hot burn, burn and they, that were going to burn you so it was really nice to have those greens, but every time you, it was very cold for me in the beginning. I remember they were all in their shirts, and I was already with my leggings and my tops and hats and everything I could to to stay warm. And the grass is always wet, so even when we're warming up, put five push-ups, and you're already like. Oh, my hands are cold. Oh, I'm all cold. And that's something I remember. It could happen in Portugal twice a year. But in Ireland, it's it's constant. Every day. Every day. Yeah, (laughs) it was part of it. And I realized how for them it was was normal. And for me, I had to adjust and adapt to that. Yeah. Yeah. But you, you played your best rugby over there in Ireland. Would you say you achieved what you set out to when you, when you went over there? Yeah. Yeah, well, I played AIL. We won AIL Division One in 2014, and I I played that game, so I was I was very happy. I think that was the achievement, and I had got the medal, and so that was very special for me, a big moment for me. Yeah, I remember I remember being very impressed when you told me that story the first time, <laughs> like obviously back in 2017, like just to turn up in Ireland and start playing and make it to the, you know, the top of the mm-hmm. domestic game in Ireland. It's incredibly impressive. So I'm assuming that having won the AIL, you went out and celebrated in Dublin city. Oh, yes. <laughs> so what is the what is the crack like in Dublin? It's uh, it's it's very good. I in the beginning, I didn't control much of that. Yeah, a lot of Guinness was around. Had you ever drunk Guinness before you went there? I tried, but I didn't like the taste. But I think uh, Guinness is good in, in Ireland and off the tap. When I tried it outside from a can, off a can or a tap somewhere else, it's not the same. So Guinness in Ireland. On the tap. <laughs> I will. We used to play on Sundays, so I I had to be a bit careful sometimes because I had to work on Monday. Some of the girls didn't need to have that careful, and they would just go the full night 
partying, but yeah, I I did it a few times, but then I was like, no, I need to control myself <laughs> a little bit. But it was it was it was fun to play with them, and it was also an honor because when I arrived to Ireland, it was in 2014, and it was the day before or a few days before Ireland won against the, the Black Ferns right. at the, the World Cup. Uh, so I was watching these girls on TV, and I watched that game at a pub with some Irish men from there because I didn't know anyone. And then these girls were my teammates. So, yeah, I, well, that, was, <laughs> that was amazing for me. I was just uh, playing... Uh, I was trying to play beside these big names of of the Irish uh, rugby. Yeah. So yeah, that was very big. And watching some of them playing the barbarians, the the first barbarians thing, oh, that was amazing to see them. And the, yeah, that was that was big. Yeah. It was a big time to be there and seeing them and having all the experience to play with them. Yeah, so you must have learnt a huge amount about the game, just training and, and then playing as well, that you brought into, I guess, yeah, all the, all the things you've done in rugby since. Were there, was there anything in particular that you think that you learnt in Ireland that you definitely didn't know before? I remember I, I like to fight the ruck close to our own <laughs> line, <laughs> defensive line. And that was something I was quite comfortable in Portugal because I was... Uh, Physically, I, I played so much with the boys that uh, I could take care of the problem uh, <laughs> in, in Portugal. And I could evaluate the players and see, okay, I can beat this one, I can't this one. So I would make my decision on that. And I remember we were in the defense in our line and I was just going for the rug. And Sophie Spence just grabbed me and... <laughs> She said, no, Sophia, we're not doing that in our descent, f- defensive line. I was like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> and I remember that was the first time. I really felt like someone was actually grabbing me and putting me on the right side. And so like, you know, Literally physically picking you up. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that was a moment where I, uh, one of the first games I played with him. So, yeah, that was um, one of the moments I learned. But they were constantly, every time they saw something they could teach the team, they were very humble and they were always trying to help others out, teaching something new. And yeah, they had a lot of experience. So we just need to, I was happy to to hear them and learn something from them. Yeah, amazing. It sounds like an incredible experience. (laughs) But you're now back here in Portugal. Mm-hmm. settled in Portugal and not playing rugby anymore. So what happened there? What is, is there? What's the state of the women's game in Portugal at the moment? I think that's a hard question. So, yeah, I, I decided to come back to Portugal after so long, far from family. I decided ah, I could spend some time in Portugal and let's see how it goes. But... I was aware if I go back and spend some time with my family, there is almost no rugby. So I decided just to put my boots away. Hang up the <laughs> uh, boots. Yeah, and just to and keep in memory all the good times I had as a player. Okay, we will move on towards the end of the show now. So this bit is always just a bit of fun. It's just to test people's knowledge of the laws and nobody knows all the laws i'm pretty sure of that but it's so time I, to find out sophia i'm afraid of that now <laughs> if you are a rugger law board so are you sure that's correct Here we go. sophia this is your question a player who is inside his own in goal area kicks the ball forward and it stays in the field of play another player on the same team who is also in the in goal area but in front of the kicker when the ball is kicked, runs forward to chase the ball. What does the referee do? I think he's offside. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) 
I think that in goal area, I was like, maybe that's a trick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need to be behind the, the kicker to run. Otherwise, you're offside. So I think I'll go for that. I think if it's a tricky question, yeah, it will be about <laughs> the area, is it? Sophia, I'm delighted to say you are a rugger low ball. <laughs> That's correct. And also, one of, out of all the questions I've done, I don't think anybody's answered it quite as emphatically as that before. This question came about because a friend of mine mm-hmm. asked me the same question because he'd seen it in a game and he wasn't quite sure. Okay. So I thought this would be an interesting one to do. But yes, the in-goal area is still part of the field of play. So he would be offside. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I thought the way you asked, I was like, oh, maybe it's, it's a tricky question. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's okay. that small, how do you say, the exception. Yeah, the know. exception proves yeah. the rule. Yeah, yeah, but it's not. Okay, let's move on cool. to the uh, stash question. So what is your favourite bit of kit or stash that you've ever received? It's the Lions jersey the la- from the last tour. Right. It was a gift, so I think that's why it's so... It was so special. All the money I was making in 2016 was going towards the expedition in Africa. So everything was going towards that. And when the jersey came up, I started dating it. <laughs> so I was going on the street and I'd be like with my, my roommate, my uh, housemate, who was, I had. Two housemates who played rugby in my team as well. And we spent a lot of time together at home, outside, at the rugby club. So every time we were going out, I would look at the stores and be like, "Ah, that's the one I want. And I can't get it because I'm going to Africa, but it's for a good cause. So I always managed to turn my back. And one day I even. Uh, put one on oh, just, okay. to, just to feel it but, <laughs> uh, I'm like no how oh, but it's so nice no 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 and I didn't get it and just the night before I left Dublin I said to one of my housemates Gee, let's just go for dinner you know just a simple burger or something before I leave and she's like yeah 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 let's go so they organized this surprise party um, at our place so I Got home, and when I opened the door, there were all these friends from work, from the rugby club. Surprise! And they gave me the, the jersey I was, yeah, the Lions jersey. Amazing. So that was, it was very special. Yeah. And every time I travel, I take that one with me. And that, I, even in Africa, I took it mm. with me to, to Africa. That was a special, that, that's the most special. Nice, and a good story too. I love that, love that. Okay, so next question. What is your favourite kit of all time? This can be any team from any era. My favourite one, this will sound weird probably, <laughs> <laughs> it's the one from Botswana in 2017. Right. Yeah, so you weren't with us no. anymore. So we watched a game, who was with us? It was... Marco Mama, he was as a volunteer with us as well in Botswana. And there was this international game, Botswana Zimbabwe. And we were watching that game on the pitch in, in Gaborone. And they're called in Botswana they're called the vultures. And that jersey had the wings of a vulture in the back. On the back of it. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's all blue. And then in the back, there was like a wings, black wings, but not too, it wasn't corny or anything like that. It was, it was nice. It, it was in a nice way. And I, I remember looking at it. I was like, wow, I, I want one of those. <laughs> and I think it's my favorite because I didn't get it. Right. I don't have any. You're still uh, yearning for it. <laughs> yeah. And even the years after that, I tried to. Get it online or even in Botswana. When I went to Botswana, I spoke to some people and they were like, no, no, there is no budget. So they only make these shirts for the players. Just right. Yeah. So, yeah, it's in my mind, but that's it. Wow, that's, that's a great answer. Favorite. That, yeah, no, nobody else has said Botswana. <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure. Okay, and last question. What is your current stash crush? Or is there a kit that you think is awful and should be 
burnt or thrown away immediately? That's a hard question. But uh, every year I try to, I think, I'll get the jersey, the Lancet jersey, and I think it's becoming ugly and uglier and uglier. The Lancet one. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> oh. <laughs> which, is, which is sad for my part because I really like the team. There was one a few years ago. I can't really say the, the year, but it was blue and yellow in the middle with some squares. I, I thought I was so terrible. <laughs> yeah, I didn't like that. But yeah, I'm still a Lancaster fan. <laughs> <laughs> you can be a fan of the club without, without loving the kit. That's yeah. fine. That is fine. Absolutely fine. Okay, right. Well, we'll bring this to an end. Sophia, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Have you got any final thoughts and maybe something about Bessie Pride and how people can get in touch with it, yourself or them? We spoke a lot about Bessie Pride. So I think... Well, anyone can apply as a volunteer. So if anyone has any interest to coach in Africa, in different schools, different places, different countries, people can just apply at their website, rugbyinafrica.org, or do they change it? They changed it. I'll I'll make sure I link everything up that we talk about in the the show notes. I think they changed it to bubesipride.com. I think so, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and if people want to get a hold of you, how would they do that? On Instagram, I think that's the, it's the best way. So it's S Sundays with another S. Another S on the end. So yeah, two S's like, at the start, two S's at the end. Yeah, and my name is Domingos. It's yeah. Sunday in Portuguese, so it's just S, extra S's. Yeah. In the beginning. <laughs> yeah. I will, again, link that up <laughs> in the show notes below. Yeah, so just thanks once again. Thank you so much, Tim. Oh, thank you, Sophia. You absolute legend. And just what an amazing story. And it's such a shame that you don't have an avenue to be involved with in rugby in Portugal at the moment. I hope that changes sometime soon. I'm now taking a a Christmas break from the podcast, but I'll be back with you in the new year with a whole raft of new episodes. So make sure to hit subscribe in your podcast player if you haven't already. Now, if you've enjoyed this podcast, you could rate and review it But what I'd really like is if you can mention it to someone in person the next time you're down your local rugby club. I hope you have a fantastic festive season and enjoy those magical Boxing Day matches. I'd love to hear from you if you play in or watch a traditional Boxing Day match this year. You can get me on at AM Rugby Podcast on Facebook and Twitter or at Amateur Rugby Podcast on Instagram or feel free to drop me an email to hello at Amateur Rugby Podcast. Dot com. So, until 2022, get out and play. This episode was also sponsored by WebPy for all your WordPress website needs. Do you need a website or do you know someone that does? Trust the rugby family and think of my company, WebPi, that's W-E-B-P-I, for your WordPress website design, build and support services. Find out more at webpi.co, that's W-E-B-P-I dot co.